she had to be honest with herself. She wasn't nearly 100% certain that she went herself when the first laser impacted her armor. Everything had been going so well, and she was so sure the whole plan would go off without a hitch. And her pony's immense surprise, it wasn't her, but Kroos, who spoiled the ambush. Now he was pinned down on top of a small rooftop as Lexi shouted into the shortwave radio to tell Oso what had happened. And apparently ponies still had ears, ears that could hear a scuffing griffin ready to pounce. It was mere seconds before three of the raiders were shooting up at Kroos, throwing grenades up barely leaving him time to push them back. Another two were blasting lasers at Lexi as she whimpered behind a corner. Just sit tight. I'm on my way, but I'm conking Kroos for this one. Oso's voice was, as always, rather calm. Lexi nodded, not quite remembering that Oso couldn't see her nod over the radio. But just as Oso signed off, moving from the primary ambush point to them, Kroos growled into the radio, Shit! How the fuck did they see me? I just knocked like a single pebble. This is bullshit. His talons raised, waiting for the next grenade. It popped up, and he instantly swatted it back down, nearly catching just a touch of the blast. They were carefully timing them, trying to get them to detonate just as they cleared the rooftop. Lexi was just happy they weren't throwing grenades at her. Mud pony, listen carefully. I need you to shoot at them. Just fire up sats and get back in cover quickly. I can't get out of here without one big turning me to ash. He grumbled, ready for the next grenade, but he really didn't want to wait. They had already been getting very close. They'd have it any second now, and if he left without a distraction, the large earth pony mare down there with the dual Gatling laser battle saddle would dust him in an instant. Just get a shot or two in. Aim for the big one. Lexi spared precious seconds hyperventilating before she clicked her armor into overdrive and popped into the alleyway and activated sats. She didn't care what was what or who the big one was. She just went from left to right, queuing up body shot for every enemy until the spell didn't have any more juice. Still panicking and nearly losing her mind, she executed the attacks. In slow motion, she watched the bullets fly. The raider mares were not all wearing armor, but it didn't really matter. The bullets almost all missed, save for two, and the first of those just had the bullets ping off the thick armor of her rump. The second just barely grazed the mare, taking a bit off of her ear. She could already see Kroos in slow motion just barely taking off, but panic started to seep into her as the slow motion didn't stop. She wanted nothing more than to pop back into the corner and never pop out again, but just then she saw something that surprised her. It was him again. She didn't notice him slipping in, but the same unicorn in his dingy trench coat, his heavy revolver aimed straight up, arcing down, leveling just inches away from one of the mare's heads. Lexi was overjoyed that she had some pony on her side, but she was also absolutely horrified as the revolver went off and the mare's head exploded into a burst of splattered blood and gray matter. She blinked and he was gone, and just as fast as she kicked herself back behind the corner, triggered the armor to return to its normal power draw, only having it activate for a mere seconds. And less than a second after that, Kroos came bouncing and flailing around the corner, his wings smoldering and a bloody red and charred mark on the joint of his left wing. Pals, that hurts! He cringed, digging through his bag for a potion, but the loud clinking made him seize Lexi by her armor and spring forward as the grenade went off. The armor was heavy, even for him, and especially for him while he was injured. He only got her about five feet away and behind some crates. Luckily for them both, Lexi landed on with her back to the explosion and crossed in front of her. The old crates might as well have not existed as the blast decimated them and showered her army with heavy splinters that thankfully did close to nothing. Can we go home now? Lexi barely managed to whimper. She would look back on the day and likely be surprised she even managed to whimper that. Come out, come out, little birdie. Don't worry, we'll clip your wings and you can be our pet. 
to Lexi, the Raiders didn't sound crazy, just very disgruntled. Ah, fucking ponies. Kroos downed the healing potion and hefted a grenade. Unlike the mares around the corner, Kroos's talons gave him the finesse that hooves lacked. Pulling the pin, he counted carefully, perhaps a little too accurately, as Lexi's heart rate went up from even watching the apple-shaped grenade sit in his palm for what seemed like hours before he finally hurled it at the mares. Yeet! The grenade bounced off the walls at the good angle, and Lexi swore she heard a mare yelp as it hit her in the eye before it went off. She made a mental note to not go around that corner again. Her body felt numb and distant, even when Kroos grabbed her and practically yelled at her. Apparently he had asked a question. Then again, now he yelled at her and she still didn't hear it. His open palm smacked her over the head, bringing her back. Does your pip buck show any more of them? He growled as Lexi blinked, just barely dropping out of her stupor. Looking down at the display, she noticed a bar still around the corner, then two more. She turned until the bars were in front of her. Kroos cursed loudly as Lexi's pupils shrank. The bars were in front of her, and so was a very heavy set mare in power armor with two Gatling lasers mounted on her battle saddle. Just behind her, there was another mare, a mare messing her ear, and with a very angry expression on her face. Oh, we are gonna have some fun with you! The heavy mare smiled down at Kroos, who visibly cringed. Lexi could see the internal conflict, like a little Kroos named Pride Kroos, squabbling with survival Kroos over what to do next. But it was just as scary for Lexi. Despite how much she scooted back as the heavy mare's hoof inched forward, smothering over her chin. And you. We're gonna have a lot of fun with you. This was one very small moment where Lexi almost preferred to just get shot. But as she watched the same hoof pull back, ready to knock the daylights out of her, a shadow cast over them. And she saw exactly how and why they had noticed Kroos when the ambush was spoiled. The shadow had barely even been the slightest of things to notice in that slight moment. But the now one-eared mare shot her glare skyward and began to unload with the one beam rifle attached to her battle saddle. But the flash of brown was just a little too fast and far too durable. The beams of red lanced forward and burned into the bulk of the giant griffin, but Oso rushed in barely skimming over her and then somersaulting upside down into her. The one-eared mare was astoundingly fast and escaped Oso's first grasp, then barely ducked under his heaving horizontal swing, which pinned the much larger mare against a brick wall with the bladed end of his weapon. But the third arc swing resulted in his grasping talon, seizing her by the neck. She was fast but had not been expecting something as big as Oso to be so relentless in his movements. As if it were a toy, Oso tore the beam pistol off her saddle, and then, as she started to savagely scream and swear some sort of vengeance on him, he grasped her face, clenching her jaw shut. He gave a sad sigh, despite the many laser bolts that had been burned into him. He looked into her eyes and, with a distant sadness, said, I'm sorry. Lexi's eyes widened as she jerked her vision away from the wow, loud, wet pop. She could hear the body hit the ground like a sack of potatoes. Swallowing, Lexi barely managed to open her eyes and seeing the twitching and spasming body on the ground as well as the one pinned in the wall with a blade-like scythe that picked up through the heavy mare's head made her clench her eyes shut again. There may be more, Crow said and also nodded. Secure the payload. I'll see to the little one. Kroos nodded and took off as Oso nudged Lexi to her hooves and helped her away from the bodies. You okay? Lexi could still feel her shivering, but she nodded. Y yeah. I, I just... I, I don't think I'm going to get used to it. Yeah. You did pretty good, considering. At least from what I can tell. He tried to smile, but a single pop of Kroos's pistol and a small red bar from her eyes forward sparkle blinked out, sent her back into clenching her eyes shut. 
I also just sighed and looked about. Popping a berry, he gave a sigh. Patting her head, he stood up. We'll be back in just a moment. We will need to move fast. She heard him trot down the alley until his wings spread. The first flap almost hid the sound of his weapon pulling from the mare's head and her body rolling to the ground. She didn't see him wipe the blade clean over the patch of armor on his leg. Also was large, but he was very efficient. It took her another few minutes to stand up. She had only refused to turn around and look back down the alleyway. She had to do a lot of pretending not to see things as she made her way out to where Kroos was standing. She instantly spotted something that she almost missed when she had seen earlier, but not been sure of. The cart the mares were guarding had been pulled up by two very heavily bound stallions. Their manes were cut short, a series of burns and scrapes. It was very clear they had been extremely mistreated, and perhaps been through some other very degrading mistreatments. Lexi sat mostly in a daze as Oso cut the stallions loose. They didn't stay for long. From the looks on their faces before they bolted, they were surprised that Kroos and Oso didn't just kill them, and the way they looked at Lexi seemed to imply that they would never really want to lay the eyes on another mare ever again. This all of garbage is going to make a bunch of ghouls like us? Kroos poked at the crate. Everything around it on the cart was just burned out and only barely salvageable garbage. No, that garbage is going to hopefully help them forgive us for being on the same side as Tyron. Also seemed a bit stressed just thinking about it, so Lexi decided against asking. However, Kroos either didn't pick up on the stress or more likely didn't care. What did he do? Kroos didn't look up from the junk as he asked. Oso grumbled to himself angrily. Tyron is very opinionated. Uh, scratch that. Extremely opinionated. He said something that they took exception to, and we haven't been able to return in a long while. He looked over to Kroos and shook his head before trying to sever binds from the cart so his armor, and he quickly began pulling it. The same problem we always have. Lexi popped up next to Oso, keeping up easily. She was very happy with the armor. It wasn't nearly as tight and uncomfortable as before, and she accurately felt like some pony else was walking for her. So, I don't, I mean, I don't want to make it awkward, but, um, how long have you guys been doing this? Lexi leaned in to catch Oso's eye. He spared her just a second of eye contact. The wheel of the carts were horrible, and he was more dragging it than pulling it on its wheels. Most of my life. Most of our lives. Well, except for Yin. Oh, is he new to the group? Or, well, heck, what is he? She kept pace with him, but the way he sighed and slightly picked up the pace showed that perhaps today wasn't a very good day for talking. After all, Kroos did ruin the ambush and ask questions that Oso didn't want to answer. But she was asking questions too. But she figured her questions were slightly less aggravating. She sighed and slowly sank back, letting the cart pull further ahead. You should probably ask him, not me. Oso continued forward, the tone of his voice clearly stating that he was trying to not be angry. But something was eating at him, more than normal. But she found something to take her attention away from it, and gave him some space. She spotted a small case wedged between two pieces of the burnt garbage heaped on the cart. Snagging it, she happily looked it over. It looked like a small case for her glasses. Her hopes went up, until she opened the case to realize it wasn't glasses, but identified the contents made her hopes skyrocket again. The container really was a glasses case, a very fancy glasses case. It even had a silk interior. Nearly 200 years in the waist did little for its exterior, but it was still in one piece. She looked them over. Four of them. Two blue, a pink, and a yellow. They sat there just looking pretty as they were waiting for her to pick them up and try them out. She peeked back, then forward. 
Oso steadily picked the cart's pace up, and Kroos flew overhead. He still looked like he was struggling a little. The feathers had not fully returned from where he took a beam or two. Picking up the pace, she nudged Oso, who looked over at her. Hey, um, I don't want to bother you too much, but can I sit on the cart and use one of these? She hefted the box, and he looked closer before shrugging. Sure, but if you wake up in a hole or gutter, stay low until we come back. It probably means that I threw you there for cover. She flinched, thinking of him simply chucking her across the street. But in the end, she nodded and climbed in the cart and sat firmly on the crate. She fiddled with her bags and finally managed to pop out the wires and tangled mess that was the wreck collector that Earl had given her. She took a bit longer to fit it into her pit buck, but when it was fit into place, she lay on the box looking over the small spheres. It was then that she noticed a few things. Firstly, the box was in terrible shape. Despite the excessive aging damage to the case, she could still identify another fabric. The patterns of damage suggested that the case was inside a bag, which was torn open on debris, which effectively trapped pieces of the fabric on the bag into the soft, fuzzy fabric over the case. It wasn't important, but she did like finding such things out. She tilted the case and noticed smudged writing on the underside. She could only just barely make out what was very likely. If found, please return to. And then she could only just barely read off an S and P as the first two letters of some name. It was extremely elaborate, fancy calligraphy. But the ink had clearly gotten wet. More than likely, it had been dropped to the ground and rained on for dozens of years. She plucked up the pink orb and plunged it into the recollector. There was a soft buzz, and the world whisked away. She wanted to blink, to pinch herself, to see if this was real. But he was there, just staring at her with positively bedroom eyes. She knew him. She knew him shamefully well. Her heart raced as he leaned forward and planted a kiss on her lips. This had not been a memory her nose would likely have felt in blood. Not just because of the kiss, but because of how handsome he was. No, because she knew him very, very well. All the mares she worked with knew him very well. He was Lexington Steele, a very famous adult entertainment star. She felt her body move, embracing him and going with the motions. But her mind was on fire. Finally, horny Lexi was winning. Logical Lexi was just standing there with a blank, unregistering face. There was literally nothing that she could do or say while this was happening. She didn't know who the pony was who put this orb in here, but she was extremely thankful. She remembered hearing news of the entertainment industry, talking about such programs to use memory orbs. She never thought they would be successful, with the overwhelming majority of unicorns across the nation being drafted or hunted down for research jobs. She never thought that there would be any pony left to make memory orbs for the entertainment industry, much less specifically the adult entertainment industry. Not only that, but the owner of the orbs must have been extremely well connected to simply get an entertainment orb so easily, especially one with Lexington Steele himself. As the act began, she could feel herself looking over at a mirror, almost as if for a better view. She instantly spotted another famous pony. The pony she was, for a lack of a better word, inside, was a mildly famous Pegasus mare in the same business. But she couldn't remember the name, and she didn't notice the wings. And she had to be honest, she didn't care in the slightest. Finally, she could just sit back and let something good happen to her. She sighed, extremely happy. Her eyes fluttered open and panic shot through her. Her mouth was taped shut. She was in a very dark room. She instinctively struggled to find that her armor was not on her, but confused found quickly that she had her 10 millimeters still strapped to her back and her legs weren't bound. Clearly, Kroos and possibly Oso had done this. Looking about, she quickly noticed that the orbs were all gone as well. She tore off the tape and, with some effort, was about to shout up a storm when she overheard voices. She leaned in to hear the heated words. Clearly, she could hear Tyron. 
His, this implied that they were in the fort, but she would ask later why she was gagged and thrown into what she guessed was a closet. They're fucking cowards and you know it! Tyron sounded very angry. Angry enough for Lexi to not want to leave the closet. I don't care. If we do this, you can't come. No matter how right or wrong you are, your mouth gets us in a lot of trouble that your crazy powers can't get us out of. That's probably why the wolves jumped at the chance to deal with us through Lexi instead of you. Oso's words were surprisingly forward. She never heard him so assertive before, towards Tyron. If you want me to stop calling them what they are, try telling them to stop. And you! She heard a loud crash, far too loud to be a simple bottle or chair smashing about. Tyron had apparently thrown something very heavy at what she was convinced was Crows. Wipe that fucking smile off your face! This is fucking pirate! Hey, I'm just here to protect the stupid mud pony. Me listening was just a coincidence. He chuckled, then let out a yelp as a massive boom echoed, and Crows' squawk was followed by a panicked, The literal fuck! You just shot me with a fucking grenade! There was a distant sound of chugging before Tyron growled again. It was a warning shot, you little shit! Also his voice pinged in with what actually sounded like annoyance. Tyron, go drink more. Kroos, go check on Lexi. I'll get the wagon ready. She could hear Tyron growling and complaining as he went off further away. The sound of empty bottles shattering and heavy objects crashing about got further and further away before she could just barely make out the sound of Oso's voice being a near whisper. Just get him drunk, he'll pass out and we'll go. We just gotta get Lexi. It's been two hours, she'll wake up soon. Crow shuddered, not so quietly grumbling. I just hope she's done. I couldn't take all the moaning and whispering. Ugh, what the hell was in that memory orb? Lexi went stiff and bright red, not even able to squeak, even as Oso answered. Oh, you know damn well what was on the memory orb. Don't pretend it's something else. Sure, but can we, like, throw water on her or something first? I am not carrying her after that. As they closed the distance, she swore she could actually hear him making a disgusted face. Of all the souls present, you are literally the only one qualified to carry her. Remember what you would have done had I not interrupted. Oso chuckled, and then nearly cut short when Oso grunted, obviously throwing a punch at him when he easily ignored. I was almost dead. I didn't. It was... Shut up. Flustered, Kroos clearly wanted to forget about the day in the snow. The argument would have continued had Oso not opened the door to the closet, and both griffins stared blankly down at the little earth beet red pony staring up at them. Oh. They both seemed to say in unison. She shifted just barely. <clears throat> can I, um, can I have the memory orbs back? Oso's surprised features turned into a scowl. No. No more memory orbs unless we are out of the field and you are somewhere very private for an extended amount of time. He almost had trouble looking at her as he grumbled the new rule. Kroos nodded and nonchalantly added, You squeal very loudly. Oso glared at him as if he didn't want to remember it. But more than anything, Lexi's cheeks burned bright red and her eyes forcefully glued to the floor. Logical Lexi forcefully tried to push any other thoughts into her mind. Then her tossing and turning loudly, enjoying the first-class ride on the Lexington Steel Express, while her friends had literally carried her to wherever they currently were, and were so bothered by it that they had to tape her mouth shut. We don't have time for this. Go get ready. Your armor's over there. We are heading to the ghouls in the hour. Be ready, or we are putting you in the box for a trip. Oso grumbled as he turned about. Crow's two left, but he didn't get far. He fluttered his way into a small makeshift nest of boxes and small amounts of loot 
that he appeared to have picked up from the building. Lexi scuttled over to where she found her armor. She felt like she had been shot. This was more than just a little embarrassing. The day had gone from amazing to stress relieving to a very high degree of all the way around horribly embarrassing realization that her friends were likely carrying her with no choice but to listen to some very private moments. Scooting under the armor, she stood up into it and hooked her pit butt, letting the armor close around her. Mumbling, not exactly ready to talk to the griffins just yet, she sat down next to her shame cupboard as some of Luxie's began calling it. But as she sat there, pushing a small rock around with her armored hoof, something caught her eye. There was no real cause for alarm, but the cupboard had a bobby pin in it. Curious, she pulled it out. Maybe they had to pick it to stuff me in there. But then, she thought, Oso was more likely to just rip the door open and cram it back. And all Kroos knew about locks was what he had learned through her, which wasn't all that much. Tyron? She shivered. Tyron would have rather thrown her off a cliff or shot her rather than even looked at her for longer than two seconds, much less helped to open a door. The little mystery confounded her for a few moments, but she stood up and stared around the camp as Osa tried uh, tied the gift for the ghouls into a better cart. It looked as though he had gone through and sorted out all the garbage, even cleaned up some of the gear. The little team they steamed to have going was very efficient, but she felt it was most likely all Oso. She never figured a creature as big as him would be so delicate and dedicated to his work. But everything did seem to be done with so much attention to detail that almost reminded her of her mother. But then again, he didn't seem all that antisocial, and Tyron was the alcoholic of the group. She started to think of all the griffins as different parts of her mom, but stopped. The whole idea just made her angry and sad. <clears throat> hey, Kroos? She didn't look up at his little nest, but she could hear him constantly tinkering with his guns. What? His answer was a little aggressive, but that wasn't that irregular. She chewed her lip, almost as if she didn't figure she would get this far. Almost as if she only spoke his name to see if he was willing to speak to her. She didn't quite know what to say. Um, what were your parents like? Looking up at him for a moment, she saw him just scoff and roll his eyes. They were like parents. Raised me and booted me from the house at twelve. Nothing special. There was an odd aggression in his voice. She didn't want to focus on it too much. It's okay if you don't want to talk about it. Okay. Good. I don't. He grumbled and started scrubbing at his gun with a small brush. It was disappointing to see him so unwilling to talk, but she didn't press it. He was already rather angry at her for probably a dozen and a half reasons she wasn't yet aware of, so she just sat back, looking down and pushing the same rock with her armored hoof. We're ready. Let's go. Oso's voice gave her a bit of a jump, but she got up and started walking towards the court. Oso had placed the reins with a push bar and a small shield of scrap metal, but the space between it all was too small for him. Who's gonna pull the cart? She looked over at it and noticed Kroos was already leaving the building. Oso walked beside her, giving her a firm pat on the back. Have you ever heard the phrase, being voluntold? Easily putting together the words toll and volunteer, she grimaced. At least she had partial power armor. It took only a few seconds for Oso to get her into the little cart to pull it. Other than having to do manual labor, she did feel a little better knowing that even if it was mostly the armor, she could actually perform manual labor. Poor pre-end of the war Lexi would have died of exhaustion just getting to the harness without the armor. Cheer up, little one. We all have our parts to play in life. Right now, the little cog in the great machine that you are is to pull the cart and not get shot. He chuckled and gestured for her to follow. As they left, Lexi couldn't help but look back and wonder what kind of role Tyron had in the great machine, Oso mentioned. 
All he seemed to do was make big decisions for the group and get really angry between getting drunk. Her mind rolled over the group, trying to line it up and take a look from other perspectives. But she didn't have much to go on. How long have they been doing all this? Tyron himself looked like he was somewhere between 50 and 60 years old. Oso looked to be in his mid-30s. Yin was a tree, and she couldn't even start to guess with Earl. With no cutie mark, she wondered if he was even a pony. The group seemed to be a specific drive. Something about their plan was bigger, much bigger than just surviving. She remembered back to the big griffin saying how those three words that drug her into the group. It's worth it. The look in his eyes didn't just convince her to join the group. Looking into his eyes, she really believed it. In that moment, a strange hope had entered her, and she really believed it. She didn't know what their plan was, and it wasn't that she doubted them, but it was almost like they were building a fix-everything button, and they could just miracle the last 200 years away. She snorted, feeling the wagon's wheels clunking about, getting caught on various bits of debris. It wasn't a problem for her with her armor, but she did wonder if between her and Oso they could program the armor to pull the cart without her. Then she stopped, imagining getting attacked while she wasn't wearing it. Every battle was terrifying to her. But with the armor, battle was just a little less terrifying. She quite liked the armor. It felt more than a little protective. She smiled, looking back at how it covered her. The inside was contoured to her figure, cupping her hips as the inside was shaped to deflect bullets and shrapnel away from her various angles, without creating a weak point in the armor. She squinted. Something was off. Slowing down, she tested what she figured was the problem by jumping. It wasn't an impressive jump, but sure enough, the harness clanked loudly. How did you get undone? She struggled to reach up to fit the harness back into place, but was having some trouble. Hey, Oso, the harness popped open. Can I get your help? She squirmed as she started forward a little faster. Oso was just a little ways off and turned about when he heard her. He trod up slowly, looking the harness over. The thing connected to her armor in three places with rings hooked over small points in her armor before a larger, flexible piece of material folded over her rear, clasping her at different sides on her flank, nearly smushing her bags. The flexible piece had popped free and was riding up. Oso looked over and shrugged before securing it. It should be good, but if it gets loose again, you'll just have to get used to it for a while. I'm going to get up there for a bit and scout out the path ahead with Kroos. You should be fine. There's nothing in the area. If we see anything, we'll come rushing back, okay? He gave her head a pat and shot off before she could answer. Huffing, she mumbled, not quite sure about what started going again. Pulling the cart as she watched the massive griffin fade as into a speck in the distance against the sky. Elsa was more than a muscle. His every action showed a small kindness. Even if he had a set amount of patience that ran out a little faster than she would have liked. He had other talents that seemed to be a decent guy, even if he had his secrets. She pouted loudly. Every one of them had secrets. She would have had secrets, too, if she wasn't so boring. Then step up. Be ambitious. Lexi slapped the ambition label on that Lexi. She hoped to see more of her. As she watched the little Lexis in her head bounce about and debate, she nibbled her lower lip. She thought of logical Lexi, the core and more dominant part of her personality. Logic. It was the hinges and joints of the universe. Or rather, the understanding of the hinges. She remembered her mother taking a carefully folded piece of paper, repetitively, flawlessly, symmetrical folds, watching the paper fluctuate and implode on itself within her mother's magic. This is the universe. It's so complex and can do almost anything. But her eyes widened as she watched the paper practically crumble up. Chaos. Disorder can be intimidating. It can throw you for a loop, certainly. I mean, look at this. But then, look. 
Look closely. Not a single new fold is made. No matter how scary chaos is, the universe will always follow its own laws, just like this paper will always default to its own pre-grooved folds. Lexi smiled. Her logical side was nearly as old as she was. Logical Lexi was something she depended upon a lot, a true gift from her mother. She smiled, picturing the interior of her mind, as the Lexi squabbled and debated. Logical Lexi soon stood on a pedestal above the rest. Others would speak up and step up, but Logical Lexi was queen of the castle. She smirked, picking up her trot when she gave a soft pop. She looked back at the harness, having come loose again. Well, screw you two. She grumbled, wondering if she should stop and fix it. So much effort would require her to stop and get fully out of the harness before getting back in a little by little. So much more difficult if Oso wasn't there with her. Maybe Oso is more muscle than brawn. She hummed, looking back. He was rather knowledgeable. He always had an answer to some sort of thing. But for all that, his talon made harness apparently suck. She picked up the pace and grumbled as she felt the harness sagging looser and looser. Every pony has their spot. The tyrant is, I don't know, the drunk, angry soldier. Also, the heavy hitter support. Yin, um, the tree, I guess? Kroos. She nodded her lower lip, trying to keep her memories from reigniting her heat. Yeah, every pony, but she stopped and blinked. The question did not inspire confidence. What was her spot in all of this? The Susie said they needed her. Oso had offered her a spot, but was it out of pity? Why was she here? Her trot slowed and she fretted. Logical Lexi within her was split in a dozen different directions, but mostly trying to figure out if she was allowed along for pity reasons or if she was really needed. No. She shook her head aggressively. Oso's words. He meant it. It's worth it. She was here because she could in some way make a difference. She just didn't know that yet. She huffed and grumbled as the stress built. Her mind rolled along, annoyed by the now flowing, flapping harness, tugging annoyingly at the spots in her armor. I want my memory orbs. She grumbled, looking down at the metaled hooves as she trekked along. She wanted another ticket to the Steel Express. Her eyes clenched shut and she quivered. She really, really wanted the memory orbs. Her eyes snapped open at the soft sound of weight on gravel, just barely audible over the sound of the cart. Something was a little ways away out of sight. She froze. All her thoughts flew out of her mind and she floundered for a weapon. But strapped into the harness, she would have to turn not just her body, but the whole cart, just to get her battle saddle, guns aimed. She started to panic as she struggled to get the cart detached from her armor. A part of her screamed that it was just a noise, nothing to worry about. But logical Lexi hounded and pounded it into her mind. Rhythmic movement, four separate sources of noise, close together, offset by only a foot or two, consistent almost exclusively with a full-sized quadruped creature. No repeating noise meant it either stopped moving or noticed its own sound as being more careful. The tension in the air was almost too much. It was like the world was holding its breath with her. She struggled with the harness until she moved to struggle to get out her pistol, wanting so badly for Oso or Kroos to just jump out and rescue her. You don't just give up, do ya? Lexi blinked at Kroos's voice, then flinched as gunshots rang out, streaking over her head and hitting the ground beside her. Oso burst from the bush. His charge was so direct and powerful, he quite literally backhanded the old transport cart out of the way before smashing and rolling about as if he was rolling around in the dirt, before he heaved and smashed his talons into the wall, and right there. A pony took form out of the nothingness, a trench coat and fedora wearing unicorn, hissing through his teeth at the excessive force being thrown onto him as he was pushed through the wall by the giant griffin. Easy there, mate. I didn't mean no harm to the lovely little dove. 
His hooves raised as the magic of his horn began to glow. And before Kroos popped down and forcefully reached into his coat and pulled out the mysterious stranger's revolver from its holster, cramming the barrel into the stallion's eye, Kroos squinted, almost as if he really wanted a reason to pull the trigger. Really? Mate? Then why all the sneaking and stalking? Oso blinked silently as slowly his talons came to constrict over the unicorn's chest, making him audibly wheeze. But with a sudden blink, Luxie's mouth dropped open at a moment of realization as she looked up at the pony who had saved her at least twice. It's you! Footnote. No level achieved. No perks. But the griffins kind of look at you weird now. 